Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay. I just begin with prayer and thank you, Lord, for the fact that we can come together and to uh, look at your word and to understand what you would say to us. And especially as we look at a partial reading from uh, previous uh, Saturday, last Saturday, and uh, the just finishing up with Genesis, and we go into Exodus. So, Lord, we just bring this uh, time to you, this meeting to you, and uh, we just uh, continue to pray for our leader, Dean uh, Bai, who's in Israel right now. He's pretty busy, Peg. Yeah. No, no, he's, he's in, in Uganda, Uganda now. now. He's made it to Uganda. And so, Lord, we just lift him up and pray for him and for his protection, for his health and for his uh, <coughs> uh, safety. So we bless him. And Lord, we just lift up all the ministry to you. And we just pray, even as this teaching is, uh, we can see through the eyes of Alia and see through the eyes, your eyes, of your love for Israel. Uh, so we bless you, Lord, and we commit ourselves to you anew. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. So um, I want to just take a look at, uh, this is one that I had started to prepare for last week. and. I, I came down with a, I don't think it was a flu, um, because it, I didn't have any of the symptoms of the flu. There was no fever, there was no I could eat, and no nothing wrong, and no congestion, no cold. But I had severe headaches, and I just had to lie down and sleep for two days or so. And it was just like, wow. So the only thing, that, you, know, you know, we prayed and all the rest of it, I have no idea what was going on in my body. But um, I just said, I, lie, I have to sleep. So I just slept and um, took some Advil and <laughs> continued on. Did some of the things I had to do, but I just said, I called you, Peg, and just said, this is not good because I can't focus in. So I just completed uh, what I was doing for this week, and uh, it worked out that I'll be here. And I'm at return base right now. Are you and, sure? uh, we're here. So let me go Genesis 50. And uh, I want to just say that the theme of the topic you have, and they, there is outlines there for those who are online. If you have the email, you can download the or look at the uh, outline. And what did I do with my outline? Here it is here. I just need to follow it. And I did not do all the work I normally do with putting every uh, detail in on the screen. So. I've only selected slides, a little different than I normally do it, and it just takes a lot of time to do a PowerPoint, and I, I had other things that were happening this week as well, so I just had to balance all of that together. But um, I have, you, you'll see it on the slide. I'm not sure if you can see my picture or not. I should put my, I should put me just a minute. I'm gonna see if I can get myself to uh, show, does it show? Show video panel. There. Yeah. I'm up in the corner there. Now you can see me. Okay. Hi. For some of you can see me. I'll just move that up a little bit here. And um, that will also, I think, show on the, uh, we are recording and we upload it to YouTube. So, God meant it for good. Uh, just wanted to say a couple of things about that. Um, one of the most difficult things I believe for most believers is to be able to see that um, no matter what we're going through, that God means it for good. Many, many believers cannot, I mean, it, it's, a, it's when the good times are there, that's not a problem. It's when the bad times, when the chaos, when the disasters take place in our life, and Jesus did say, you will have tribulation. And so a lot of believers come to the false belief that when they become a believer, they're not going to have trouble. They're not going to have problems. Well, Jesus said, you will have tribulation, but do not fear because I've overcome the world. Uh, I would say that that I have overcome the world is not saying I will remove all your problems. He says, I will take you through those problems, but that is based on, I believe, 
on our attitude and our mindset of how we see these things that are happening in our lives. And this is the key to this, this uh, you know, chapter 50 of, of, uh, of Genesis. But also, there are some commentators that said that the whole of Genesis, this is the theme, this is the, 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 the focus theme that God meant for good. It, the brothers will see meant it for evil, what was happening to Joseph, but God meant it for good. And if we could probably come to the place of understanding that uh, in, in no matter what we're going through, and that's hard to do. That is extremely hard to do. I mean, last week when I was having headaches and lying down, like there was no way that I, at that moment, that I actually focused in and said, well, God means this for good. But I do know that he uh, ultimately was going to bring me through it and that he was going to use it for his purposes. And I have no idea what it is, but I believe that uh, whatever it was, whether it was a spiritual attack or whether it was just a physical attack or whatever it was, that I was submitting it to him. But I just had to say to, to return ministries at that time because I was going to do a teaching. I just said, I can't do that. And uh, I'm just um, taking time to rest in the Lord and to do it. Obedience is better than sacrifice, Peg is saying. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, I just want to just say, uh, when we're looking at all of this, it, it is really amazing that, um, and you know, and I'm going to bring this up again, but um, I believe the foundations of which we live are extremely important. Now, this is not going to be on the screen, and I'm just giving you my five foundations in which I live my life, okay? Now, no matter what I go through, even when I was going through last week, and I don't normally get sick, I don't get the flu, and I don't get colds, and I praise the Lord for that, but I, um, when, I, when I was having these horrible headaches and just had to sleep. I mean, I just had to lie down. That's, I, I couldn't, I tried to go on my computer. I tried to read my the scriptures and I, my, just a focusing in on something like that was beyond me. And I, I could do it for 10, 15 minutes and I'd have to lie down and I'd sleep for an hour or two. And so uh, I got a lot of sleep. It was, it was really nice. I loved my bed and uh, it was really good. But, um, you know, I, I have five foundations and number one is God is, supreme i'm sorry god is sovereign first god is sovereign that means he has all authority the second one is god is supreme that means he has all power now those two are important because that he, he has given us authority over evil for sure you know that jesus did that in matthew 28 he said, all authority i give to you and that's to you know to conquer evil etc um and but that authority is from him and he has all authority he is sovereign he is supreme he has all power he's all powerful and i know that um that gets into problems and there's some people that would say that god controls everything that's happening to you and everything that happens in our lives um and others would say well no he doesn't cause evil he doesn't cause sickness he doesn't cause these things to happen he may be allow them and, and there's quite a controversy i know even in our own church we've gone through that where the, the sovereignty of God and the supremacy of God is, how does that work out? And uh, God does allow things. I mean, he allows free will and he has, you know, people can sin and they do sin. They choose to sin and it affects you and me. So you might have a husband or wife. You might have a, a family member. You might have a person in your church, you might have in your workplace and they will do evil. They will hurt you. They will, they will just, uh, disappoint you and as a result of that it affects you and me and so God does allow that and uh, but he also wants to take us through it but the not only God is sovereign and God is supreme but he always does what is right and that for me is the one that no matter what is happening God will always do what is right and he uh, no matter what is happening around me I know that God is uh, he will do, he, he's not going to do wrong. He's not going to do evil. And then the 
fourth thing is really is that he is a god of love okay and and uh uh he 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 no matter what's happening he loves me in the midst of it and and the other part of that is he is a god that is good he is a good god so that's that's the number five where you you can change those around you know but 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 he is if i know he's a god of love he loves me and that love never stops no matter even if i'm in rebellion and in sin he still loves me but the, the fact is that that he is um also um what was the, what was the fifth one i said good. <laughs> he was good <laughs> he's a good good god and i don't doubt his character and just because something bad is happening i don't go through the thing of questioning is god um against me is god a bad is he is, is is you know what's going on and question whether he loves me question whether he's a good god those those things are solidified in my thinking ahead of time now it's not great when you get into chaos and when you get into problems when you get into you know marital disputes and all the rest of it to have to work through those so it before beforehand those are already solidified so again, you know, just going through it, God is sovereign, God is supreme. He always does what is right. He's a God of love and he's a good, good God. And so that, that's all. Now, having said that, uh, you may say, well, you know, what about Joseph? And when he was going, that's what we're going to be dealing with. And that's all of Genesis was going through the from Genesis uh, 40 onward, uh, talking about uh, Genesis yeah, 40 onward is Joseph's life. And how could Joseph go through this? And I find it amazing because we have the scriptures, we have the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand what God is like and, and we, his character and how some of these things operate. But Joseph didn't have any of that. He didn't have any scriptures. He didn't have, uh, he wasn't filled with the holy spirit he he was in a sense god was with him we know that and, and but that we have the privilege as believers in jesus to have jesus live in us and the holy spirit live in us and to be have the baptism of the holy spirit and to be filled with the holy spirit but i'm just astonished at the insights of joseph so let me go through and i want to just read uh from uh you'll see in the outline and the notes you have is that it most uh, of the scriptures um, in your Bible will have it broken down into three parts. And sometimes uh, the titles are a little different for each part. But the first one I was just going to be talking about from verses 1 to 14 is uh, the last desire of Jacob. So let me go right into the teaching then. I'm going to read verses 1 to 14, and we'll read each uh, scripture as we go into it. Uh, so verse 1 of Genesis 50, then Joseph fell on his father's face. Now, he had just uh, met now Jacob. They, they brought him, uh, you'll see from uh, in Genesis um, uh, 49 that Jacob has just died. They brought him into Goshen, but now he has died. And so then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him for seventy days. Now when the days of the mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go and bury my father, and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. 
Only their little ones, their flocks and their herds, lay left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. And it was a very great gathering. Then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan. And they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. He observed seven days of mourning for his father. And the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad. And they said, this is a deep mourning of the Egyptians. Therefore, its name was called Abel Mizram, which is beyond the Jordan. So his sons did for him just as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham brought, bought with the, from, with the field from Ephron the Hittite as property for a burial place. And after he buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers and all who went up with him to bury his father. So let me just walk through a few of those things. Um, really, at the, uh, to understand that we need to probably take a look first at the, um, uh, and Jacob had a desire, and it's really in, found in uh, Genesis 49. And if you can turn your Bibles to it, or it's up on the screen as well. But uh, Jacob wanted to be buried, uh, even though he had gone to Egypt, he, he, now he's reunited with Joseph. He's they're living in the land of Goshen, beautiful land set apart, fertile um, land, beautiful, perfect for sheep and for uh, animals. And uh, but now he's died, and he wants uh, uh, to be buried in Canaan. Now this is a really amazing thing because uh, he knew because the promise given to. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they were going to be living in Canaan. That was going to be their land. Um, Joseph knew these promises too. This is an amazing thing when you go through this story. Remember Joseph, he's in Egypt, but he knows. He knows the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knows this. But in, in, uh, in Genesis 49, verse 29, it says, Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. This is Jacob speaking. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan. Now we know that as a land. Where, where is that now today? In, in Hebron. Yeah, it's right in Hebron in uh, Judea and Samaria. And so this is where he said, I want to be buried, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. Now, why do you think uh, 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 Abraham had purchased that plot of land? Like we sometimes people say, why would Abraham, he insisted on paying and buying that land? Why? Yeah, to, for, for his burial and for the burial of Sarah and for those to come after it. But also I believe is to have a stake in the land where he, was going to all come back to this was whole land was going to be theirs but he is actually purchasing and saying this is the land in which we will be buried this is the land which we will own eventually and we will rule in and so it was really a a, a seed if you will and then he says and there they buried abraham and notice who they buried abraham and sarah his wife they buried isaac and Rebecca, his wife, and there I buried Leah. So Jacob was saying, you know, and, and not, not, not Rachel, it was Leah, which is amazing, eh? And uh, 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 yeah, Rebecca died just outside of Bethlehem. Uh, Rachel, uh, Rachel died, yeah, sorry. Re Rachel buried just outside of Leah, uh, which uh, was the one that, um, you know, instead of, uh, Jacob said he loved, Rachel, but he married Leah, and that was through a little plot there that took place. Yeah. So, um, but it says the field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet in his bed, into the bed, and breathed his last, 
and was gathered to his people. So uh, we, we understand that now that, that that's the command. And uh, in, in verse one of uh, Genesis 50, it says, then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Wow. Um, did you notice that it said he wept over him? Um, I, I, I still remember when my father died and when I was age 13, probably one of the first funerals I'd really attended. I, I can't remember any funerals before that, but certainly with no one that I really knew well um, if I had attended, because I don't remember. Um, but um, I, I do remember that when my dad died, and I was you know, just 13 and it was, uh, he was an alcoholic, so it was a very difficult time. But um, then they had an open casket. And I remember just before they closed the casket, my mother commanded each of us to go and kiss the father, my father. Right? And uh, I never understood why he, she would do that. But um, I did it. And I, I remember I, it, was, it was not a good thing. You know, I, <laughs> and, and I had to deal with all of that later. But I understood where it came from because uh, I often see, you know, having done so many funerals, very often they will go up to the open casket and very often will kiss the, on the forehead or whatever of the person, even though they're embalmed, okay? And, uh, the, and it comes probably from here because, you know, and that's certainly, I came out of a Catholic tradition and so this was all part of tradition, you know? But, uh, the fact is that he wept over him. Now, Joseph was a man who wept often. I don't know if you noticed. Does anyone just really quickly, just one or two, when did he, else did he weep? Over Benjamin, yeah. Well, just uh, I'll take you through a couple of them. His yeah, his brother showed up, right, yeah. So in Genesis uh, 42, uh, we read, and uh, uh, he, he first sees his brothers. They don't know him yet, okay? But uh, Reuben suddenly realized when he was demanding that, you know, they go back and uh, bring Benjamin and et cetera. And uh, Reuben answered them and saying, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them or he spoke to them through an interpreter. Up to this time, he spoke to them through an interpreter. But then Joseph turned himself away from them and wept. You know, that was the first time we see that Joseph wept. And then he returned to them again and talked with them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And so Simeon was to be kept until they went back. And uh, they were you know, going to have to bring back um, uh, Benjamin. Uh, but then in verse Genesis 43, it says that he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin. So this was the first time he had seen him, his mother's son, and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. And then verse 30, now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. So then we see that Joseph... Uh, he was a man who expressed his emotions, which most of us as men have trouble with, and we're taught in our culture and society not to. But uh, in many ways, more today it's open than it was when I was growing up. Um, and certainly when I was in the military and when I was in the airlines, et cetera, we were taught you know, emotions were not a good thing. It was very, it's a weak thing, and it was a thing you just did not do. And so you're, Showing no emotion was a sign of strength, which is not, but it's a the culture was. Now there's much more openness. But then in Genesis 45, um, uh, and then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from here. So all the people had to leave. He was going to be left with his brothers. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians of the house and the Pharaoh heard it. So it was like amazing, amazing. And then in Genesis 45, um, he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers. 
Now, these are the ones that had betrayed him and caused all him to, you know, threw him in the pit, um, sold him. And, uh, and, and in, but he wept over the brothers. That's amazing, eh? And after that, his brothers talked with him. Um, and then in Genesis 46, uh, then he sent Judah before him to Joseph. Now, this is when uh, they're coming into the land of Goshen, uh, and Jacob is with them. And, and Joseph is going to meet Jacob, and uh, they 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 sent him, Judah before them to Joseph, uh, him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. And then they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot, went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. He presented himself to him, fell on his neck, and wept on his neck a good while. Wow! wow. So we can see the emotion of. of uh, now, I, I, was, I put in here as well the, uh, the whole area of emotions. And, um, and, and I, like I say, I am not a, an emotional one, but I had shut that off. And I'd made an inner vow way back when I was, I remember, in, in grade seven. And I remember uh, exactly when it happened. And I just, because uh, I was embarrassed by a bully on the field in front of everybody else. And I cried. And then they all laughed. And then the bully made more fun. And I still remember that, you know, it was so, it was so vivid. And uh, so I said, I will never cry again. I will never, ever show emotion again, ever. I will not allow it. And I never did. And then for years and years, even after I got married, I realized I didn't show emotion. People would weep and I, I wouldn't weep. And finally, I said to the Lord, I, I think I need to deal with this. And uh, he took me right back to that place when I was bullied and the vow I'd made. And so I went and I renounced the vow and said, Lord, I, 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 I've sinned. I want, I renounce the vow. I ask you to break it and smash it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's at, from that point on, he began to allow me to have emotion. Now I'm still not considered an emotional person, even by my own family, but now, now I watch move, you know, I watch a sh show or something. And, I'm, and the tears are flowing down. I'm looking around. Nobody else has got tears. I'm going, I guess there are emotions there, you know. And uh, so I do feel emotions. Uh, and my, my daughter-in-law, she always is praying for me to have more emotions, you know. And uh, I know that um, she'll say something has happened. She says, how did you feel, little Joe? <laughs> and I'll go, well, there's that question. How do I feel? You know, yeah. you, you don't ask men how do they feel because that's a hard one on them. But I, you know, I, I, I would laugh and I said, I actually felt emotion. I felt uh, this and I felt that before I just feel anger, maybe. But it, now I feel, you know, whatever. And, I'll, and, I, and she says, that's good. That's very good. Good showing emotion. And, uh, but I'm not at a place where I, I, I cry readily, but I do uh, certainly have, have had tears. And, uh, and, and but it's opened up that whole area. But I, I love in Jesus, you know, the, you know, and he went and uh, Lazarus, remember the story? And he's a man of sorrows, it says in Isaiah 53. It says, therefore, when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Referring to Lazarus. And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then it says, this is the shortest verse yeah. in the New Testament. John 11, verse 35. Two words. Jesus wept. Uh, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Now, there's a lot of people who would look at that and say, Jesus wept. What was he weeping for? Right? Why was he? He knew he was going to raise Lazarus. Did he? Why was he weeping? They thought it was because he loved him. It may be. But it may be that you know, and there's lots of people who have different thoughts on this, but it may be that he was weeping because they did not understand that he was the resurrection and the life. He didn't understand that he was the Messiah that will get rid of life. And they just didn't see this yet. They were so in in involved in the temporal. But I don't know. You can. Uh, there's lots of different commentaries on that. But Jesus did weep. So he, he had emotions. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it's okay. So when we look at all of that, um, I just want to go on and uh, as we read along, and I'm going to go back here now that we, said, we saw that in, in verse 1. But in verse uh, 
uh, 2 to 3, it says, And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm the, his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. And 40 days were required of him, for such were the days required for those who embalmed. Now, some Christians really get up, you know, they have different feelings on things like, you know, embalming and whether that's a good thing. They'll say that. Some will even say, well, it's a pagan thing. It's an Egyptian thing. And so that we, why do we do that? Now, for the Jewish people, they don't embalm. They immediately bury them. How quickly do they bury them? The next day, within 24 hours. And they put them into uh, a place where then the, the bones can be kept as the a, as a, as a body rots, wherever it would be. But the fact is, is that they don't embalm. And they would believe it, it's a, an Egyptian thing. Many of the people also, some of the commentators you will see, um, really criticize embalming because from the Egyptian point of view, when you did embalming, you did prayers, you did, you did all kinds of symbols, pagan things, occultic things even, uh, with the pharaohs who were embalmed and were put in their coffins and et cetera. And so uh, they would say, well, this is really not a good thing. Why did they allow it? Why did Joseph... Um, yeah, well, the thing is, is that it's very interesting. Um, it says, Joseph commanded the servants, uh, his servants, the physicians. Now, that word physicians is really amazing because it's not the word that would normally be used for those who did the embalming process in, in Egypt with all their uh, prayers and dedications and uh, symbol, uh, uh, symbols. And, but the words, uh, physician, and it's used, and I just read it, and Joseph commanded his, his servants, the physicians, to embalm the father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required of them, for such were the days that are required for those who were embalmed. So he went through the embalming procedure, but the word physicians that's used here is a word for Rapha. That's Rapha. You look it up in Hebrew, which is cure, heal, repair, physician. So these weren't the normal ones. Now, the Living Bible tries to deal with that whole thing about uh, whether it was, uh, you know, one of the ones who did the, the, the priests that did their prayers and did their uh, incantations, etc. cetera. But uh, the fact is that the Living Bible says they're morticians. They didn't know what to do with this. But really, it's Rafa. It, 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 and it, it means a, a physician. It means a, just a, a normal medical person. So he went through it. And I, I think that's good in, in that sense is that uh, he didn't enter into, he didn't do what the Egyptians did. But they did do something in verse uh, three, uh, verse three of chapter 50. And the Egyptians mourned for him for 70 days. Why 70 days? Well, 70 days was the time that the Egyptians had set aside for pharaohs, for kings, for the very top echelon, mostly only for pharaohs but and kings. But the thing is, is that they, uh, they set aside 70 days here. That's amazing uh, to honor someone like this. So we see that uh, there's something happening here. Joseph was so well respected that they were even treating uh, this as a, a huge event. Um, now, the reactions of the Egyptians are um, it was amazing. Um, oh, before I do that, yeah, the, the reactions of Egyptians, just to go into that. And it, it says, now, when the days of mourning were past, um, oh, wait a minute, uh, 40 days were spent. <laughs> Oh, 3B, and Egyptians mourned for him for 70 days. And um, that's a long time, and that the Egyptians did that, so they set aside that. And, but they honored him so much that they would do that. But did they remember that? Did they remember him? Well, if you go into the next chapter, and you go into uh, Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, it said, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. 
and they forgot all about him. I find that amazing, isn't it? They, Joseph did all that, that he did. He saved Egypt. He changed everything. So Egypt, actually, the pharaohs owned all the land after Joseph did what he did, you know, the seven years and seven years, et cetera. And suddenly now, Egypt is rich and has everything. And then you go into uh, Exodus and it says, it rose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph and totally forgot about him, forgot the whole legacy. And I knew I was at a funeral on Saturday and, you know, Howard Katz uh, had passed away and he was a pastor at Open Doors Christian Fellowship. And when you go through, he writ, wrote 19 books. He uh, began the church, which is now 600, 1,000 people attended. Uh, he, he, he reached out different people, came forward to talk about how he changed their lives and how he called them. He, he called some people every week, even uh, when they were struggling and away from the Lord. And like, I mean, it was overwhelming, the legacy that he had. And you sort of feel sitting there watching it going, what have I done? I mean, <laughs> my life compared to that, you know, and you came out and, and you, I had to really deal with that whole atm you know, attitude of saying, <laughs> I, I haven't done anything compared to this. But I know one thing is that uh, people forget very quickly. And I see that in organizations. I see that in different, even Christian organizations, but even secular organizations, there'll be people who will build up a company. And guess what? Uh, after they leave, somebody else will come up, somebody else will change the whole company around, they'll change the focus. And then the, the, the whole legacy of the person is forgotten very quickly, within a matter of years even. And so I know that even in our church, you know, our pastor, senior pastor died and now the new pastor. And, and it's forgotten. New people come in, the church the direction is different, and, he, and it's really forgotten. And only because we have internet and because we have other ways of helping to restore the memory, but people forget very quickly. So all your achievements that you spend all your time doing, especially if it's not for the Lord, you be, do all this and you think you have a huge legacy and people are going to remember you forever. Forget it. It's not going to happen. They're going to forget very quickly what you've done. And so the only things that really count are the things that we do for the Lord. The only things that we do unto him, which will go on for be silver and gold and precious stone. Otherwise, it's going to be wood, hay and stubble. And it's going to be forgotten very, very quickly. And so I, I just want to bring that forward. But, but praise the Lord for the scriptures to help us remember Joseph. But the, in the land, it is very for, forgotten very, uh, very quickly. Um, well, let me finish before I go on to this next part here. I just want to walk through on your notes there. I talked about the fact of the, the request for Pharaoh's permission. So in verses four, when the days of mourning had passed, Joseph spoke to Pharaoh and asked for permission to go. And so he was honored to do that. And as a matter of fact, we see the, the, the tremendous respect that was given by Pharaoh. So Pharaoh says, go and bury your father as he made you swear. And then it, look, look who went with him on this journey. And it says, um, uh, it says, so Joseph went up to bury his father, verse seven, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh. Wow, all the servants of Pharaoh. The elders of his house, not just the servants, but the elders went as well. All the elders of the land of Egypt. Oh, my goodness. And then as well as the house of Joseph, his brothers and his father's house. And then only the little ones, their flocks and their, birds, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And then it says in verse 9, and there went up with them both chariots and horsemen. What were they for? To protect the group. Now, this was a large gaggle of people, if you will. And, uh, and, and, and then it goes on, and, and, and there went up with them and uh, the chariots and horsemen, and this was a very great gathering. How many do you think that was? Well, just going through uh, some history and going through a little research, and I was relying on others, but they estimate between 300 to 500 would be in that group. And uh, that's just the, the officials and the elders. 
And so, and then they had the army that would be, be protecting them because they'd be going traveling. And they, 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 this would be a, a, a month's journey, uh, at least, um, maybe more. And so, and then to get back again. So it'd be two to three months for sure um, that they would have to do to go to Canaan and then back again to Egypt. Now it's only 11 day journey if you just don't stop at all, you're going fast. And, uh, but, but uh, with a whole group of people like that, <laughs> traveling and eating and providing and all the things they had to do, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a huge undertaking. And of course, uh, he gets that permission, they go. And, and, then, and then in verse um, uh, 10, it, it, then they came to the threshing floor of Atad. Now that's just over across the Jordan. And it's uh, just on, uh, parallel with, if you will, with um, uh, Jericho. So it's um, just be over the Jordan. So they get into the Canaan and they mourn there with a great and solemn lamentation. He observes seven days of mourning for his father. Why seven days? Well, the Jewish people today follow the same thing. After the person dies, what do they call it, Peg? A Shiva, yeah. They have a seven-day period where family comes in and they, you know, you can uh, speak and comfort them and, and pray with them or whatever. And uh, But it's a seven-day period. This is maybe where it came from. It's very Jewish. Uh, the 70 days that they were doing was very Egyptian for kings and pharaohs, but the seven days is very Jewish. And we see the roots of it even here. And then when the inhabitants of the land of the Canaanites saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a deep mourning of the Egyptians. Therefore, they called its name Abel Mizram. Mizram is the word for Israel. Mizram, that's in Hebrew. And Abel means uh, mourning. So they saw the deep mourning. And Mizram. Is, is that Mizram. Yeah. Yeah, that's, oh, did I say Israel? I'm sorry, Egypt. In, Miz, in Mizraim is Egypt. Sorry, you're right. It, it is Egypt. I, that was just a mistake in my part. Thank you for the correction. And then, of course, they returned uh, to Egypt. And, uh, so they, after verse 12, they did as they commanded. The sons carried him to the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah. And, uh, and then it says, verse 14, and after he buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brother and all went up with him to bury his father. So that's very interesting. And uh, I sometimes wonder, I wonder if Joseph was even tempted to maybe stay. <laughs> but the, the young ones and the, the, the women were back in Goshen in their fields. And, but, but Joseph did know that Canaan was going to be the place where he was going. He, and you're going to see that he actually says that at the end of his life, he knows that that is where they're going to go. But he goes back because he said he would. He was a man of his word, right? Yeah. So let me just go on. And in verse 15, and Joseph's brother saw that the father was dead. And they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, Thus you say, shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespasses of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then again, you see him weeping. Eh? Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Or am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about as it is that in, in it, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid, I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is an amazing slide of verses. And just want, uh, you, you take a look at the anxiety that was going on there. And it says um, uh, in, in verse 15, and it says, uh, perhaps Joseph will hate us 
and may actually repay us for all the evil we did to him. Now, why wouldn't they understand that he had already forgiven them? He kissed them. He wept over them. Why? Well, jo Jacob had passed away now. And why is it that they would think that he might turn on them now? Probably because why? Yeah, the protection of Jacob was listed and Jacob had passed away. But the thing is probably because that's what they would have done. And, you know, for ourselves as Christians, perhaps the, one of the most difficult things other than going through things and being able to see that God is uh, still involved and he's working things out for good and he's sovereign and supreme and, and, and that he's there. Um, and the, the, the thing is that I see is very, when Christians go through a situation where someone offends them or hurts them or does them dirt, the natural thing is to retaliate, to get back at them, to hurt them, and to not forgive. And you might say you forgive, but you're waiting for an opportunity in which you could really get them back. And uh, it is so, so difficult. I mean, I, I continually see it in the body of Christ. Uh, people say, yes, I know I'm supposed to forgive. <laughs> but when it comes to the rubber meets the road, they don't forgive. They won't forgive. And I, some say, I can't forgive. No, you can forgive. You won't forgive. That is the question. You want to get back. But I know when, you know, I've had things really, uh, people, I've been betrayed at least four times by cl close, close people. And one time it really hurt. It really cost them my, the ministry that was flourishing at the time. But it's natural to want to do them and get back at them. It's natural to want to fight back and, and, and to hurt them. It's natural to want to defend yourself. It's natural. But the thing is, is that we're called to forgive. And I'm going to just go into that in a moment. But the carnal nature in us rises up and says, I have a right to do this. I have a right to defend myself. They were wrong. They need to be punished. I have a right to do this. And we see that in marriages. We see that in uh, relationships in churches. and. Uh, uh, you know, we've had teaching in the church and yet we still see it happen. But the fact here is I, I, what I like is that Joseph has a, an attitude that's so Christ-like. It is so filled with the Holy Spirit that I'm astounded by it. And uh, uh, we know that in Romans 12, for example, um, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard, again, you say repay no one evil for, have regard for good things in the sight of all men if it is possible as much as depends on you live peaceably with all men beloved do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath for it is written vengeance is mine i will pay saith the lord and so we see that this whole area of of, of getting back and is is, is is entrenched in us and the scriptures, the New Testament particularly says not to do that. And it goes in verse 20 to 21. Therefore, if an enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. For in doing so, you'll keep heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, that, that's beautiful words, but it's so difficult to do when, when it's happening to you. And I know that I'm just saying this and... and and then in James, James 5, this is the one that gets me as well. Do not grumble against one another. And the word grumble in the Greek, I, I was looking it up and seeing what it meant. And it really means grumble uh, out of impatience uh, because you're not happy with what they've done and how they've reacted. And you grumble, you're sighing against them, it says. But do not grumble against one another, brother, unless you be condemned. Whoa. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So when we get upset at people and we grumble and we, 
again, it's when things happen, and you probably can give examples of this as well as I can, as soon as something happens to somebody, they've been done badly to what happens, they go and tell other people. They go and tell what they, the other person has done. They're there to get sympathy, they're there to get comfort, they're there to hurt the other person and just to go after their reputation, whatever. And one of the difficult things is to be able to do people do that is, is you know, part of you want to le listen and hear and comfort, but it also is very important to shut them down and say, no, I'm not going to listen to this. It, it, this is gossiping. You need to leave, you need to deal with this with the Lord and you need to come to a place where you can leave it with him. Because when you start to partake in it and listen to all the stuff, you now have become part of the sin. You have become part of the problem. And the person will keep dumping on you and keep sharing with you and keep telling you what a dare, ter, dare, terrible person they are, all the dirt that they've done. And, but we're not allowed to do that. And it, it is so, so difficult to do that. It's by the power of the spirit that you can do that. He will give you the power to do it. And so I, when I look at that, I, I just take a moment and uh, I go, wow, the, Joseph is, ama is amazing. But then we go into the appeal for, for forgiveness. In verse 16 and 17, the brothers, you know, they're showing their own carnality because they think that Joseph is going to respond and do them evil, right? But then he, they won't even face Joseph directly. What do they do? They send messengers they, to Joseph saying, before your father, now they're using the, 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 you know, the trump card, as it were, their father, right? Eh? Before your father died, not our father, your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin." for they did evil to you. Now, please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And so they have come to the place of saying, look, we're your servants. They, 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 they submitted themselves that way, but they're using a, a messenger to send this and using their father to obtain forgiveness. But the fact is that they're already forgiven. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Joseph has already forgiven them. But they are coming out of their own area of, of, of concern. Um, but, you know, uh, we are to forgive. And uh, I keep, probably this message needs to be preached again and again for believers. In Ephesians 4, that all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted. And look at the other one, forgiving one another. Now, the next part I didn't highlight, but it's as important as forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, I will say something here that sounds harsh. I would say, if you cannot forgive, if you do not forgive another person, you do not understand the forgiveness of the Lord. If you truly understand how much you and I have been forgiven, the, you will forgive. You will choose to forgive and you will draw upon the forgiveness of the Lord to release them. Now, I will take, I do different things when people come up and they say, I can't forgive, which means I won't forgive. I'll take them through different reasons why they should forgive. There's many scriptures that tell us to forgive. I'll tell them you won't be forgiven if you're not, don't forgive others. I'll tell them that your prayers will be hindered. I'll tell you about you're binding yourself and giving that power, person power over you. But the real reason, ultimately, that I would say, and they very often don't understand that, is I need to forgive them as I have been forgiven. And once I understand the immensity of how much I have been forgiven, the natural, the, you know, the spiritual thing that will happen is I will forgive others with that same forgiveness. As a matter of fact, I will take people, some people that will go through the steps of why they should forgive and how to do that, leave the, uh, the punishment in God's hands, uh, to release the consequences of their actions to the Lord and go on from there. But often when uh, I will come and when people can't and won't uh, receive forgiveness, I'll take you through one more step. And the step I'll take them through is this. 
I said, well, sit down. And I'll say, no, I want you just to ask the Lord to separate your brain, your, your intelligence, your, your, your thinking process uh, and from your spirit, from the, 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 the spirit part of your being. Just ask him just to put that aside to, and then to, would sink down into your spirit. And now just say, I, I, I now, because you dwell in me, Holy Spirit, you dwell in me. Jesus, you dwell in me. Father, you dwell in me. And right now, Jesus, you are the forgiver. You paid for my sins. And now I ask you, Jesus, I release forgiveness. I ask Jesus that your forgiveness would go out of me and go on that person. And uh, people are able often to do that, basically. Have trouble with saying I forgive them because they've been hurt so badly. But I say, will you release the forgiveness of Jesus? Oh, I could do that maybe. But that's what we want to do. Get to the place where we can release the forgiveness. And I've seen at different times where a person, when I've said, no, just at, let that forgiveness just surround that person. Let, let, and and, and let, let Jesus just deal with it. Just let that forgiveness surround them. And, 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 and we're going to stay there for a moment until the peace comes. And the person says, yeah, okay, I have peace. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, now just come out of there. Now, what's going on in you? And they say, it's done. I forgive him. So it, it's allowing Jesus' forgiveness to flow through you. I mean, I understand very clearly. I think most of us understand people are hard to love, right? Some people are very hard to love. But I can love them with the love of God, right? The love of Jesus, I can love them. And I choose to love the unlo unlovable with the love of Jesus. You and I can do that. No matter how obnoxious they are, I can love them with the love of Jesus. I can't with my natural love because my natural love is very conditional. Eh? But the love of Jesus is unconditional. And I can do the same with forgiveness. I can release the forgiveness of Jesus so that people will be forgiven. And once I do that, it releases me as well. It releases the person as well. And so, it, but, but, but the, the basis is that if I understand the forgiveness of God, that's for me. And in Colossians 3, it says somewhat the same thing. Uh, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against you, uh, against another, even as God forgave you, so also must you do. So for me, again, I keep going back to this. If you're having trouble forgiving, go back and, and, and just take some time in meditation of understanding how much I've been forgiven. And if you're having trouble with your spouse, take time to understand how much God has forgiven you and then do that same forgiveness and release them. And, uh, you know, it, it, somehow we need to get past that place. And, and once you understand, like, I understand I've been forgiven so much. Like, I mean, and, and I understand I've done a lot of sins in the past, and et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, for me, I go, I, I can't believe that God has forgiven me. I can't believe he forgave all that I've done. And I've done some terrible things in the past. And uh, because when I was walked for 29 years as a non-believer, so in, in, in military, in the airlines, the whole work. But he's forgiven me all that. So now I want to release that forgiveness that he's forgiven me because I've been forgiven so much. I understand the depths of that. And I want to just be a, a forgiving person. Do you see how that works? Uh, I, 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 and, and then I, I love in Colossians 3, it goes on. But above all these, all, all these things, put on love. Why put on love? Because love covers the multitude of sins, <laughs> doesn't it? That was it. Or there was someone said multitude of faults, that's okay too. But when you have love, you forgiveness is part of that. Mercy is part of that. And so put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God ruling in your heart, to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. So I just want to, and, and in Psalm 130, going into the Old Testament, because it, and it talks about this forgiveness, which is not just a New Testament thing, it's Old Testament as well. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord God, uh, Lord, Lord, hear my voice. 
let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? But, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And for me, again, that even that verse there, uh, if I don't forgive, I probably need to fear the Lord. I need to have that fear of the Lord because forgiveness is, 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 is so important. So having said that, I, I just want to just walk through that. But then look at Joseph's uh, affection um, in verse 17. Uh, it talks about... Um, Uh, where, where are we just going back to 17? Um, they, they're talking about forgiving, and then his brothers went and fell for uh, Verse 19. Now, and let me go skip over to 19. Um, right now, I just, just want to skip on. I've taken more time than I thought. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Now, I find this an amazing thing. What is it? For I, am I in the place of God? What is Joseph referring to here? He's, when he says, am I in the place of God? He's saying, who am I that should not forgive? Who am I that should take revenge? That's God's realm. And yet most of us, when we go through difficult times and people, we want revenge and we want to actually exact that revenge in some way or hurt them, or hold on to it, and break a relationship, and not forgive them, and not release them, and yet, that's the place of God. Now, I look at the different places where it says, am I in the place of God, in verse 19, and it, that, that phrase comes up in two different places, and very interesting, in Genesis 32, uh, it says, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, this is a uh, Jacob had gone through with Leah, now he's got Rachel, but she doesn't have children. And Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, and of course Leah is having children, give me children or else I die. That's what Rachel says to Jacob. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel and said, am I in the place of God that, that who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So Again, he recognizes it's only the power of God that can do that. So he's applying it to uh, barrenness. But in Second Kings, it was interesting when the Naaman was going to go to Israel and the king of Israel heard that Naaman was coming for healing from his leprosy. It says it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and says, am I God <laughs> to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks to quarrel with me. And so, again, the whole area of healing and of, uh, is, is seen here by the king of Israel, uh, who sees that it's only God can do that. But I also just say Joseph applied that to he forgiving, not just you know, barrenness, not just healing, but to forgiveness. Forgiveness is something that we, and, and, and revenge, that's all in the hands of our God. So I just want to just leave that with you and the thoughts of that. But I want to go on and in verse uh, 20, it, it, it talks about the, uh, uh, the, probably the attitude that we need to have. And Joseph had, saw, and he says, but as for you, you meant evil against me. Now that's very interesting. Joseph saw that they meant evil, but then Joseph goes to the next step in verse 20, the second part of it, wow. but God meant it for good. Now, how did Joseph know that God meant it for good? You know, uh, he understood the fact that their God was even his prison imprisonment, that God was going to be using it for good. He saw it somehow. He saw it here. And he's saying, and, and, and then he's going to go on to say in, in, in a moment that, uh, that it was meant for the saving of many, many lives. 
But you know, we have scriptures that actually talk about this. And the one that I like, and you probably know very well, is Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I like the NIV version. I like this version of King New King James Version. But the NIV says, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Um, I think this is a good translation. And that's one I, I very often would say, I know that God is working for the good of all that's happening to me. Okay. If, if I can catch that and know that whatever is happening, no matter how bad it is, God is working in the background, even though I can't see it, for my good. And he's going to bring good out of it somehow. But my attitude will determine where and how that works out often. If my attitude is bad, I'm going to bring a whole bunch of negativity into my life. I'm going to bring consequences of sin into my life. If my attitude is good, I open it up to receive the blessings and to see the good that he is doing. God's still going to do the good, but our attitude will really affect us as we go through that situation. And we may get through it and we may eventually repent of our bad attitude and and we surrender it all to the Lord. But I'd rather go through a bad situation with a good attitude so that when I come out the other end, I'm going, thank you, Lord. I saw you were there all the time and I trusted you. I didn't see you, but you were there and it is good and you meant it for good and you'll see the bigger picture i mean it, we, even for for ourselves we see anti-semitism going back we pray every week as intercessors for the hatred for the jews which is rising 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 against the jews all around the world um and and and, and people in canada uh jews in canada they are so upset uh, of what is happening. They see last year, I think it was 30% rise in anti-Semitism. In the States, it's rising. In Germany, uh, they just came out with statistics. It was uh, in the 40% anti-Semitism is rising. Uh, England, the same. They're just seeing it all over the place where anti-Semitism is rising. But there is a way of looking at anti-Semitism of seeing that God will bring use it for good. What is that? Well, we see it from this ministry is what? Alia. He's calling them home. He's using it to get their attention so that they will hear the call to return home. And, I mean, and, and, and the disciples, they couldn't understand when Jesus died on the cross. I mean, it looked like the end of the world. It looked like the worst thing had happened, their Messiah that they believed in, that they put their lives in, they left everything, followed him, he died. A terrible on the cross. But what was the purpose of his death on the cross? Redemption, <laughs> Redemption yeah. He was giving salvation to the whole world to, to, and, and, and opening it to the Gentiles. And, and, and the same thing even uh, when we look at, you know, the whole area of how Israel fits with the church, you know, God is using, he used, the, the rejection of the Messiah by the Jews to open up the message to the Gentiles. And that looked like a horrible thing that the Jews had rejected Jesus, Yeshua, and in his time, and, and even following that. But Paul argues in Romans 11 that that opened it for the Gentiles to come in. I mean, that's God's plan to use it. But also, now the part that we missed is that because we now in the church have forgotten about Israel for the most part, but God is going to use our salvation to bring forth the Jews back into the, the revelation of who Yeshua is, and it will mean life for the world. It will like, be like life from the dead, it says. Yes. So, yeah, their mercy, yeah, it just is it keep, it given and then it's giving back. And so seeing that bigger picture is so incredibly important in all that we do. And so Joseph did this. I am just absolutely amazed. And it does say in um, uh, um, 
but God meant it for good in order to bring it about, as in this day, to save many people alive. So Joseph saw that it was to going to bring forth life to his people, and he was doing it. And don't be afraid, he says, I'll provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Oh, my goodness, look at the time. So let me just finish off here. And I just wanted to say, um, uh, Joseph, you can see his forgiveness because now he's assuring them, he's comforting them. And then in the final days of Joseph, let me just read this and I'll just close off with a few comments. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt. This is verse 22. He and his father's household and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. Now that means to the third generation is what? To their great grandchildren. Yeah. Children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. That's the third generation. Uh, the children of Machir, the son of uh, Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knee. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land from which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, see, Joseph saw this. He saw that he was going to bring the people, the Jewish, the Hebrew people, into this land of Canaan. And Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So he was saying to them, I want you to carry my bones and take them back to Canaan to be buried in Canaan. Now, they didn't get buried in the cave of Machpelah. But where are Joseph's bones? Where were they? In Shechem, yeah, it, which is also called Nablus, yeah. And so it is, uh, and, and there is a place, no, it's difficult to get there to see it because the Nablus is a Palestinian village. And uh, if you want to go there to visit, you have to have an armed military escort. It'll only be at certain times, normally at night, and but it's a real problem to get there, but you can see it. We didn't have an armed military escort. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you had time. <laughs> you had time. No, we had to him. Oh, I can't. <laughs> okay, then, uh, then verse uh, 25, says so Joseph took an oath and said, surely you, God will surely visit you. That means he'll take care of you. That word visit means to take care of you and you shall carry up my bones here. So Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin there. And so I just wanted to say, uh, you know, again, uh, Joseph's um, had that confidence that, uh, uh, that he was going to be, taken up he swore made them swear that they take him back but look at isaiah 46 i just want to close off with this it says remember the former things of old for i am god and there is no other i am god and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and i will do all my pleasure and then it says in verse 11 calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, and I like this next part, I have spoken it, it will come to pass. And he says, I have purposed it, and I will also do it. And I love this because it just brings forth, God is saying, uh, I, I, I have a purpose, and I'm going to bring it forth. I want you just to trust me as I'm doing this. And in that trusting is understanding certain things like the whole principle of forgiveness and not avenging and not holding grudges and not uh, um, taking revenge, etc. And But he says, I'm going to bring it forth. But his, our attitudes as it we're taking, as it's happening is extremely important of how some of that will play out into our own lives and how it will affect us as we go through it. And we can be negatively affected or we can be positively affected, but our attitude of obedience and our attitude of who he is, our attitude of his character, our attitude of trusting in him is extremely, extremely important. It comes the same thing with we come to the Jewish people. By the way, it, it did say, um, um, uh, 
in verse 26, we often don't pick that up, but Joseph, they, they embalmed him and they put him in a coffin in Egypt. Now, the coffins is not a, just a, an ordinary box. A coffin, it was an ornate, precious wood box and they had an elaborate ceremony for the pharaohs of putting him in the pyramids, et cetera. But in this case, they took him and they put him in a coffin, meaning they highly honored Joseph. He was highly honored at that point, which is uh, amazing for that. But as we close off, I just see again Joseph being one that had amazing, amazing insight of being so Christ-like and so uh, an example for us that I can't, you, know, you just look at it and stand in amazement. You stand in amazement. And I just wanna encourage all of us to be able to see him. Now, I have the name Joseph, which is good. And uh, it means he will add. And uh, I just say, Lord, I, I just want you to add on to in my own life because of that's my name. But um, I, I'm just going to stop there. I didn't cover some of those points, but I did. I think I got it through mostly what I wanted to say. You can just take some notes yourself. Um, it's straight off of it. So let me close off, and I'm not going to stop the recording, and we can talk for a bit. Lord, thank you. Uh, we just come and bring this to you, and we just commit it to you. Help us to understand, Lord, um, that you mean it for good. Everything that we go through, all the things we go through, and Lord, even if we don't understand it, um, you know, when evil comes, no matter what others intend or what is happening around us, Lord, you have the power and ability to bring out good, and you mean it for good. And so, Lord, I pray that all of us would have a revelation of how that actually works in our life. We leave this with you now. We do it in the precious name of Yeshua, our Savior. Amen and amen. Yeah, yep, I will do that. Okay.